A few years ago, we were kind of looking at the church and feeling like the church was, was growing, and uh, we needed some pastoral help. About five years ago, six years ago now, we, we sent Kevin Bailey out to plant Anthem Camarillo. Kevin has a pastoral gift. Uh, if, if I look at my own life, I have a title of pastor. I don't necessarily have a pastoral gift as it's described in Ephesians chapter 4, and it felt like something that was missing from the life of the church. And so we started praying about that. Lord, what would you do? Who would you bring? How can we, how can we fill some of the, the pastoral needs that exist here in Anthem Thousand Oaks? And uh, Ahmad and Ashley were a part of Anthem uh, maybe three, four years ago they started coming. Four years ago they probably started coming. And uh, about a year and a half, two years into that, they decided to move to Portland and abandon Southern California. I guess it's pretty cool up there. Um, so they moved to Portland. And then they came back to visit. And Ahmad was sitting right there and I was sitting where Evan's sitting. And I, I saw Ahmad out of the corner of my eye. And I think I, I sent a message to our, our elder team just saying, guys, I think we should consider Ahmad uh, and asking him to come and be a part of our staff team. That was like a year and a half ago. So about a year ago, I called them and said, hey, we want to start talking with you guys about this. And after a year-long conversation, they moved down here this week to be a part of our team. So I wanted to introduce them to you so you can get to know them. So would you guys introduce your family, and then I'll ask you a couple of questions. So, so I'm Ashley. This is Elijah. He's four months. Naomi is six, and our three-year-old... Oh, sorry, Naomi's five. She's <laughs> Naomi's five, and our three-year-old son, Isaiah. I keep thinking she's six because everyone's asking me, has she started kindergarten? And I associate six with kindergarten. So. All right. Almost 26. <laughs> almost 26. <laughs> oh, almost turning six. I thought she said I'm almost 26. I was like, whoa, that is <laughs> profound. She like she's five going on 26, guys. It goes so fast. Um, all right, so Ahmad, would you tell us, give us a little bit of a synopsis of your family. Who are you guys? What do you enjoy? What's, what's the Milby family like? Well, we, <laughs> exactly. We, uh, I, we found out in the first service, Isaiah likes picking his nose. Um, yeah, um, right here on stage, first service. Uh, but we're just a family. We love people. We love to hang out together. Um, okay, come on. And... Uh, as I said in the first service, we love to bring people together. Like, I love to cook. We both love food. I think that one of the best ways to bring people together is over food. So um, we actually have a sign-up sheet in the back with the other sign-up stuff. Uh, we just want to open up our home to you guys. You can sign up. We have different nights of uh, different kinds of dinner. Uh, and then just sign up, and we'll give you our address, and we'll have fun meeting you guys. And actually, I do need to clarify one thing though it says Domino's pizza night that's not we're ordering Domino's it's come play Domino's if you don't know how to play I'll teach you <laughs> and we're gonna make homemade pizza it's so better, yes so, Ahmad and I met in college um, Ahmad and I met in college we've been married tw uh, 11 years now and he was on the football team and he taught me how to play Domino's and that used to be our weekend activity was playing Domino's and Ahmad's girlfriend was pretty good at dominoes, so <laughs> that's become our thing. And when we were Anthem, we taught um, our community group that we uh, attended and led, we taught them all how to play dominoes, so it's something we would love for everyone to learn how to play. It's a really fun pastime for us. Awesome. Now, let me just, just to clarify, what he just invited you to was there are open sign-up sheets at the info wall to come and eat dinner at their home and get to know them. Now, I don't I don't want you to gloss over that. They are coming onto our team to lead our, our community life, to build uh, the family dynamic of the church, to, to pour into the body. We want you to get to know them, and we want them to get to know you. This is really important that you take advantage of these moments, that you say yes and go into somebody's home and eat amazing food and have a great time and get to know them. So please do not hesitate. Like, when they say we want you in our house for dinner, they mean we want you in our house for dinner, and, and you need to take advantage of this. So I want to encourage you, please, don't just gloss over that. Take advantage. Yes, we, we really do. We love the church. We love to bring people together. I do have to say I am bad with names. I actually, I just, I was so confidently, like, just introducing my wife to a couple, and I was like, oh, this is Chad and, and, and uh, Kiara, and both names wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I thought I had it, so please forgive me if I get, like, a letter we'll wrong or something. Um, 
Matt said the church family, and I shared this in first service. Uh, we're in the Conejo Valley without our actual family. Um, both Ahmad and I's parents have passed away, and so we, our kids, this means they don't have grandparents. The church family is truly our family, um, and so the body here is super important to us and our kids. And so when we say we want to become family with you, it's a genuine, the real family. So let me ask you guys this. Uh, you're here. We, we brought you in with a minimal job description. You know, it's just kind of uh, the ambiguous come and, and be a part of the team. Minister, pastor, love people, encourage people. Let's build them up. Let's build community. Uh, what do you want to see happen? What would be your desired outcomes as the church grows together? <laughs> I would just love a to help facilitate Anthem, Fal uh, Anthem Church truly just becoming a family church and everybody having that sense of I belong and this is my family and this is who I do life with, this is who I see on Sunday, but this is who I see, you know, every day of the week and, or not every day, but, you know, most of the days. And uh, just a family culture here and I know when we, when we left Southern California, the biggest thing, the hardest thing for us was that we loved Anthem so much. We loved the people here so much. And we were like, we think we should leave, but Anthem, we just don't want to leave Anthem. And so God brought us back. We we're so excited just to serve you. And we're here for the body. And so we just want to love on you guys and get to know you guys. So just please know that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, would you join me in praying for the Milbys uh, uh, just as they get settled? They're, they literally moved in or are moving in this coming week. And uh, it's get the keys today. <laughs> <laughs> you got the keys. Hey, way no, to go. We, uh, no, we get them in like two hours. Oh, we're, okay. so, we're so excited. Uh, Tom and Los aren't here anymore, but uh, we've been at their house and they were out of town. Um, and we had to text them like, hey, sorry, we're still here. I hope that's okay. But they've been so gracious. And that's awesome. awesome. Very cool. Well, let's pray for these guys. Uh, Father, thank you for this family. Thank you for the joy that they bring to my life as friends, as, uh, as ministry partners. Lord, we are so excited about them joining uh, the effort to lead, uh, to bring direction, to bring community, to take the things that you tell us to do in the Bible and to live them out as a, as a church together. I pray that we would grow in that, Lord. And, and even as the body here is hearing Ahmad and Ashley, Lord, that there would be a desire for more, a deeper sense of community, a deeper sense of belonging. Uh, Lord, draw us together as we go on this journey of faith uh, and, and pursuit of you and of your mission here on earth. And would you help us to do that together as your body? We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the Milbys. Thank you for getting them a home and getting them settled, Lord. We pray that you would bless them and use this family in a powerful way in this community, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, I said that I would talk about Celebrate Generosity. Uh, the event is happening on Sunday, October 22nd. The event being, we are not going to gather here. We're going to gather at a park in Thousand Oaks, Conejo Creek Park North. Uh, one big service at, at 10 a.m. Ventura, Camarillo, and T.O. are all gathering at the park. The purpose of us gathering together, A, it's going to be a fun family day, soccer, cornhole, tacos, all that kind of stuff. It's going to be a great day. But the main purpose of us getting together is to be able to, uh, to call on the church to give generously. Everything that comes in uh, that day and the entire week following that we get in the mail or online, 100% of that is going to go into our Celebrate Generosity giving, which uh, we talked about last week. One third of it is for our global initiatives. Uh, this week, we're talking about a third of it being for our local initiatives. And next week, we'll talk about a third of that going to our reproducing church or our church planting initiatives. These are incredible opportunities for us to pour out generosity on the world around us as God has poured out generosity on us. So what we did today is we uh, invited in Tammy Barnett, who's the executive director of Raising Hope, and asked her to share a little bit about this ministry, uh, this, this organization that is pouring into the foster care community uh, in Ventura County. And so I'm going to have Tammy come up and share with you guys. Would you welcome her with me? Thank you so much. Um, 
I, we're so thankful to be here. We're so thankful to Anthem for all of your support. You may not know this, but um, you guys have been huge supporters of Raising Hope and the work we're doing with children in foster care for quite a while. I think we have more Anthem people um, on our team than any other church uh, represented. We're so happy about that. Um, and I wanted to ask if you're in this room and you have um, been part of anything related to Raising Hope, a fundraising dinner or our Hope for Kids Festival and Run, or you've called and um, asked for legal advice or something like that, if you um, can just raise your hand, that would be great. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. So good. And next year, I know we'll have even more, right? Um, I wanted to introduce Dawn. She is my co-founder. She's here um, cheerleading us. So, um, uh, The way that we started out is um, I was a lawyer for children who were in the foster care system in L.A. and Sacramento counties. And as I... Um, represented them in court and got to know their stories, I was just broken over how they were being raised with almost no guidance at all. Uh, so many of them came from, you know, moving around kind of nomadic backgrounds from home to home, and they didn't have any stable person in their lives to really speak into them. And so, you know, that verse that says, you know, when Jesus says we need to, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It really struck me because I thought, well, how do you learn what love is? How do you learn to love God? How do you learn to love your neighbor? Which really is sort of the root of all sin. If we are not loving God and loving our neighbor. And, um, and then these children are in the foster care system with no real examples of positive love and godly love in their lives. And so uh, we wanted to do something in our own backyard to bring awareness to the needs of children in foster care. So we started the Hope for Kids Festival and Run. And that's a really fun day, April 28th. We already are planning for that. Um, and we did it, and it was great. We raised money. We had a great time, and we thought, well, let's just keep doing this as long as it makes sense. And God just kept growing it and growing it until we decided about three years ago that we needed to incorporate into a nonprofit. So that is where Raising Hope came into being. Um, there are a lot of things that we do to serve the community. Um, what we try to do is not reinvent the wheel, but we try to fill in where other things don't already exist. There's a lot of great organizations in our county that help with children in foster care, um, and we want to do what's not already being done. So with the money that we raise, we provide textbooks for youth that are going to college. Uh, we'll do housewarming parties for kids that are moving out of the foster care system and getting their own apartment. Um, did you know that Med the Dentical will pay for a seven-year-old, for instance, to have a tooth pulled, but they won't necessarily pay for the anesthesia required to do that. And uh, how many of you would like to get a tooth pulled without anesthesia? Okay, um, so we help pay for the anesthesia. Um, and uh, if they don't have it, then they just don't get the tooth pulled and they don't get the dental help that they need. Um, we also help with camps. We, do, we have a transportation fund, which is vital to our older youth that are maybe working two jobs and uh, going to school, and sometimes they have kids of their own. Um, we also have a mentoring program, and we also do gift card drives, and we fill the gift card bank for the county workers to give the youth when they're graduating, when it's a birthday, especially for those older kids who may not um, be as met with the toy drives and things that, are, that we do around the county. Uh, we had a young man that called us once, and he asked us for help with his textbooks for college. And I remember Don was talking with him and she asked him, well, you know, where are you going to school? When does school start? Oh, well, school started in about a week. Um, he was going to Cal State Channel Islands, but he was living past Palmdale in Lancaster. And, uh, you know, so she sort of said, well, do you know, do you have a plan? Are you moving down here anytime soon? He's like, well, I was, but my housing fell through and I don't, this is the only place that I have to live and they're about to kick me out. And, um, but I, and my car's broken down. So I just, and so we kind of start thinking, like, why are we going to pay for this guy's books if he can't even get to school? Um, but we wanted to do more for him. And so we ended up doing, we repaired his car for him. Then we found someone to take him in, actually someone who is part of this church, to take him in and let him live. And then... Um, and then he and then we bought his books <laughs> so he was able to get the whole package and that's just a little taste of what we do um our vision for the future is to grow we're we're doing a lot of legal advocacy right now for families and children trying to make sure that the kids are being as well represented as they possibly can so ways that you can get involved is you can donate you can sponsor our event 
You can come walk, run. You can make anthem t-shirts. I already had somebody who wants to do that. Um, you can uh, come be part of our Hope for Kids planning team. We're already meeting, and we're like a family. We meet uh, every month right now, and we need different people for a lot of different kinds of roles. Um, you can also become a mentor. We are mentoring, sort of focusing on the older youth, because if you can't take someone into your home as a foster family, you can walk alongside them through their life and be that consistent, solid person that's speaking into their life. And you can show them the love of Jesus, which is our main goal, right? Um, if you're a lawyer and you're in this community, we'd love to talk with you. We're trying to rally the legal community around making this change to improve the legal services for children in foster care. So we'll be at the back. Um, please come talk to us. We're really excited to be partnering with Anthem. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, Tony. Guys, here's the thing. We can't wait to dump a bunch of money into Raising Hope. Like, honestly, it just, it's such, as, as a church, we have a, we have a primary mission. Uh, our, our, our mandates are laid out in the scriptures, and while we are called to take care of the widow and the orphan, uh, it, it, it can never, it, it never formulates as our specialty, as our full-time attention. And so to partner with ministries and organizations that have given their entire lives, their entire focus to pouring their energy and attention to being experts in the field, that allows us to extend the reach of ministry as a church beyond what we can do organizationally and use people like you guys to invest in the foster care community. This is a great way for us to partner together uh, and, and broaden the reach of what we can do. So celebrate generosity is one way. Obviously, there are many, many more, and we encourage you to stop by the info wall, get to know Raising Hope, hear more about how you can be involved, uh, especially if you have any of the skills that Tammy mentioned that, that could be useful moving forward, okay? Uh, all right, next up, Vicki McCoy. Come on up. Vicky is the executive director of Zoe LA, and do you still have a role with Thailand, or are you? No, okay. pretty much LA. You're all LA. So she's the, the executive director of Zoe LA, and uh, is gonna share with us a little bit of the vision of, of Zoe coming from Thailand to LA and what the hope is. I'm just gonna give a quick disclaimer. Uh, there are gonna be some images up on the screen. We're gonna ask that you just not take any pictures of these images. What's, what's coming up is for us and for this room, uh, but can't really go beyond here because there are just some issues with project development and people that can see them and can stop what they want to see happen uh, if, we're, if they're not careful. So we just wanna ask you guys to enjoy them, view them, <laughs> but don't share them, Thank okay? Thank you so much. Thank yeah. You. Thank you so much for your generosity. It is just really amazing to be with you this morning. We're going to go through this really fast because I went long the first service. So um, if you put that up, Ms. Danae. So this is our vision for Thailand. And we have just one little piece in the top right-hand corner if you move on. So in L.A., um, we're going to rescue kids from human trafficking that's happening right in L.A. County. We'll have a... a contract with Department of Child Family Services, Department of Probation, and they'll place kids in our care, anyone that's being rescued from human trafficking. We purchased 50 acres of land uh, in the Acton area. Now, somebody in the first service said, where is that? Exactly. So it's between Santa Clarita and Palmdale, if you know where that is. Some, he didn't even know where that was. So this is green because it rained a lot last spring and that was the perfect time to take pictures. Right now it is really brown. But you can flip through those uh, pictures there. So we have 50 acres of land and really the need is great for placement. There's really no place for these kids to go. They're going to foster families and running away or they're going to other group homes and they're just running because they're in the city. Well, if they get here, the first thing I'm gonna teach them is how to use a snake bite kit and that should keep them in the house. <laughs> so, so 50 acres of land, but also what I want you to know is that we will also contract with Ventura County, Kern County, Orange County, San Diego County, all the other counties around will also open up to be contract with them. You go, does it really happen in Ventura County? Yes, it does. It's happening in every one of our cities, and so we just have to become aware and have a place for these kids to be restored. So here, the vision, um, our full vision plan, 
This is 50 acres of land, and every one of those buildings have an important role in bringing restoration to these kids. I'm going to focus on two places. Phase one is a children's home for six kids. It's about 3,500 square feet. Each child will have their own room. There's nothing like that that's happening in the county or in our state. And then also the sports therapy center. It's really a multi-purpose room for home-based learning, vocational training, and life skills training. And so really giving these kids a hope and um, just a place to discover and fail in a safe place because they're going to fail. So once we move from there, then this next phase, after we get a um, conditional use permit, is called our Discovery Center. And so this is like the top view. If you go to the next slide, this is like Main Street at Disneyland. Each one of the front facades would be like home-based learning or vocational training. And each of you have a role in that. So somebody is a graphic designer. They're not going to learn that from me because I don't know how to do that dance classes, music classes, cooking classes. Like, I get to be the house parent there, but these kids are gonna die if they depend on me to cook for them. <laughs> that, it's like 300 calories, microwave three minutes, that's how we eat, okay? So I need some of you to help teach these kids how to do different things. And again, just find out what are they created to do. There's a movie theater or a theater on site that will seat about 250 people. Now you go, you're only gonna have six kids or the most 24 kids. This is a gift to the county and the county surrounding. surrounding. So anybody dealing with kids that have been rescued from human trafficking, foster families, group homes, anybody will be able to use this facility. And then also trainings can take place there for law enforcement to learn what to look for and how to treat kids when they're picking them up and social workers to learn about trauma-informed care and foster families because that's part of our continuum of care for these kids is for foster families to learn. Like it's scary. Who wants to take in one of these kids? Your heart says yes, but you go, that's scary. Well, if we teach you about trauma-informed care and why do kids act the way that they act and take care of the behavior and love casts out the fear, then, then you go, okay, I could do that. I could do that, right? Jesus just wants us to say yes. And so each one of those places, how do they get a job? How do they keep a job, right? And it's like, oh, I want to try this. Oh, nope, don't like that. Come over here and try this. But this is a safe place for them to discover and to learn. So thank you again for your generosity. It is huge. The plan is big. And Jesus knows exactly what we need. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Danae, would you go back to the, uh, the site plan, the whole uh, the picture of the whole site plan? Um, Thank you for your awareness of time. I appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, I just, I want to take a few moments. Okay. Uh, so Vicki walked us through. We, we act, uh, got to go on site to their office, and she walked us through all of what is going to happen here. It took her an hour and a half to, to give us the detailed explanations of everything, what phase they're at, how far out the, the different phases are going to be. We got all of the info, and she graciously took that hour and a half and condensed it to four minutes for you to be able to hear. <laughs> um, I just, I guess... My hope for you guys to see this is, uh, and this is one of the things that I've loved about you, I've loved about Mike and Carol, is just that the vision goes way beyond what's right in front of you. Uh, right now they have uh, the, all of the, the processes in place to build the first children's home mm -hmm. and the sports therapy center. Those have both been approved or just the home? Or um, in we're the in the process. We submit our site plan review, and so we're waiting. It takes 8 to 12 weeks to be approved um, to be able to then move on to building and safety. So the first thing that's going to land is a home for uh, six girls to live in, and, a, and they need to build a well to get to the water. There's plenty of water down there, but they need to build the well to get to the water to provide for uh, the, the property. Uh, you guys can just be praying. Honestly, right now, be praying for Zoe. There are so many little things that need to happen in order for uh, the home to be built, for the well to be dug, and we just need God to pave the way where humans and our capacity ends. We need God to step in and, and take over. Uh, the entire project could be years and millions of dollars, but the vision is there and the favor is there. They are starting to see more and more uh, access points to the, to the city, to the county, uh, just incredible things that God is doing already. And so we just want to pray and see God do great things 
Because honestly, we just want to see kids not trafficked anymore, rescued and placed into loving homes and cared for in the way that Jesus has them. So uh, thank you, Vicki. This was not, I would give you the entire Sunday. I, I honestly, uh, thank you for being here and for sharing that with us. Thank okay? you so much. All right, Vicki, thanks. All right, uh, so you guys, I know I said this last week after we talked about Touch Nepal and Zoe Thailand, but that, that's why we do celebrate generosity. And uh, last year we took in $128,000 uh, on Celebrate Generosity and the week following it was a huge and exciting thing. I would love to blow that out of the water this year. Like I'm, I'm praying that, that each of you is taking seriously the opportunity to start setting money aside specifically to be able to give to celebrate generosity so that we can lavish God's generosity in powerful ways. Uh, so again, that's October 22nd, 10 a.m. We're all gathering at the park. Everything that comes in all week, we do a lot of online giving or checks that come in the mail. Uh, 100% of that will go out into church planting, local initiatives, and global initiatives. So please, please, please be praying about what God is going to have for you to give uh, at Celebrate Generosity. Anthem students, you guys are free to go. Released grade six through nine. You can head out with Phil. You guys will be talking about very similar things to what we're talking about in here. Just, you know, with a little middle school twang to it. So I guess middle school and high school because we have ninth graders. Andrew would be very frustrated if I called him a middle schooler. Uh, let, me, let me pray for us, and, and then we'll dive into the scriptures. Uh, Lord, would you be with us as we walk through your heart, your, um, your call on us to see the world differently and to live accordingly? Help us to hear your voice this morning. We love you, Jesus, and praise you in your name. Amen. Uh, we talked last week about uh, the, the heart that God has for the nations and the impact that we want to see our generosity make around the world. This week, our hope uh, is to talk about what God wants to do in us to see the area immediately surrounding us differently. As we come to faith in Jesus, what does that do to our eyes? What does that do to our heart? What does that do to our actions? How do we change and reshape the way that we are living in light of the gospel, in light of God's kingdom uh, taking over our lives, his will being done on earth as it is in heaven, how do we change the way that we see things? Uh, this is one area for me, I just want to share this with you as we go into this. Even preparing a message like this brings conviction because I am not where I want to be in the things that we're going to be talking about. And I have two choices in that. I could hide that message and run away from it and not preach it, or I could listen to what God is saying and continue to be shaped and developed by the things that he wants to say to all of us. I, I just want you to know, we are we're pointing together towards what God wants to do in our world and in our lives, and I want to walk together as a church towards that. I just want to make that really clear. Sometimes it can be hard to listen to something. You feel like, I don't know, just because I'm teaching it, I've got it all together. That is not, that is not the case. This is a journey that I think 100% of us are on as we talk through the way that God wants to shape our eyes and our hearts for our community. So one of the big changes that should happen, now this is in the should category. It's not necessarily in the will. It doesn't happen automatically, but it needs to take place in our hearts is that as we come to faith in Jesus and give our lives to him, our vision of the world needs to shift. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 5.16, Paul's writing and he says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So what Paul is saying there is, look, we previously saw each other as flesh and blood. You were either a friend or an enemy. You were uh, helping me or you were in my way. You were somebody that I loved to be around or somebody that was obnoxious and annoying. You were flesh and blood. And Paul says, now that we've come to faith in Jesus, that's not how we see people anymore. We start to see them as the soul that God created and desires to be with for eternity. That we go beyond simply the person that you can see, that, that people are no longer to be used by you, that people are no longer to be simply in your way or obnoxious or annoying to you. They are God's creation that he longs to have as a part of his eternal story. 
And when we are growing in our relationship with Jesus, that vision is starting to take shape in us that we see people differently. And so that has an impact on how we live. And we're going to spend our time walking through that kind of impact that that should have as we grow in our relationships with Christ. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn in them to Leviticus chapter 23. I never get to say, turn in your Bibles to Leviticus. It's very rare that that actually happens, and it's happening. So prepare yourselves. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. Let me give you a little bit of a backdrop. Uh, Moses has gone up onto Mount Sinai. He's received the Ten Commandments from the Lord. He's brought those to Israel. There's a big covenant moment, like a marriage ceremony where uh, Israel is presented at Mount Sinai and God says to them, I will be your God and you will be my people. And then Israel says, all that you have said, we will do. So it's sort of like the I do, I do moment of Israel and God becoming uh, a, a people together. And then God goes and he says, all right, Now, if you're going to be a community, a nation, a people, uh, a faith together, you need to know how to interact with each other, how to relate to each other, how to love each other and care for each other and exist in a community. And so that's where Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers come in, is it's the how-tos of community. Now, Leviticus can be very confusing if you've ever done the read through the Bible in a year and you're like, I don't need to know how to clean my animals before I sacrifice them. That just doesn't resonate right now. Like, it can be a hard book to read because there are things that are very distancing in Leviticus. But one of the things that we see is even though we don't follow the Old Testament sacrificial law, we see the heart of God. And there are elements in Leviticus that show us God's heart for humanity. How does he want us to treat people? And this is one of them. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22 says this. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Okay, this is a very important passage for us to grab a hold of. Okay, the ancient Near East as a, uh, as a region, if you've never heard that phrase before, basically refers to the entire Mediterranean region. Uh, historians refer to it as the ancient Near East. It was an agricultural community. Okay, whatever you raised, you ate or sold. Like that was life. Uh, You had flocks, you had fields. That was the way that you did business. It was an agricultural society. So God, as he gives commands to Israel, an agricultural society, it's going to have implications for them. This is their economy. This is their way of life. This is their work. This is their time. It's all of that. And God has something to say into that space. This is what he says. If you have a field, I need you as you're growing things. So this is both conceptual and literal. As you're growing things, I need you to not harvest all the way to the edges. You're going to leave the edges of your field so that the poor and the sojourner can eat as they need. Now, what, what's significant about this is that God is expressing his heart to take care of the poor. The poor in this context is anyone in Israel that has come on hard times. Right? Their land wasn't growing quite right or uh, they, they had to sell off things to pay for something else. Maybe they were born with a deformity or some form of uh, some issue that disallowed them from working. Uh, sometimes these are widows or orphans. There are different things that have gone on that have put people into the category of being poor, incapable of taking care of themselves. And God says, I want the edges of the field to have unlimited access that anybody that needs it can come in and they can have food. Israel will be known for its generosity of margin. You're going to keep the edges of your field for those that need in our community. And then he talks about the sojourner. He talks about the person that's traveling through, a sojourner, a very nomadic society. Again, let's say you're living in Egypt and and growing your crops and a famine comes through. You can't grow crops in a famine, so you pack up your whole family and you move to a different region, find some land, and you start growing again where there's not famine. So people were constantly roaming around and being in different places and different regions, and Israel was at the hub of all of that constantly in the mix of people traveling from one place to another. And God says to his people, I want you to represent me. I want you to bear my name. 
And what that means is I want you to act generously so that the people from foreign lands that are coming through know that Yahweh is a God of mercy and compassion and generosity. I want them to know what I have for them, that there's more to the story than the gods that they worship or the the things that they do to carry out their religious practices. I want them to know that there is a God above all other gods. He says, I am the Lord your God. So one of the chief calls of God on his people is to live with margin, to live in a way that, that the life that they have been given is not maxed out to the very edges so that there's nothing to give, so that there's no possibility for generosity. He says, I want you to make a practice of dialing that back off of the edges so that you can give to those in need. We'll come back to the issue of margin in a little bit. The story of God continues. We see God's heart for impacting uh, the people right around you with the heart of God, his heart of compassion and generosity. So you can turn in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 34. This is Jesus speaking, and Jesus gives us another glimpse into the heart of God. What does God want for us, his people, in his kingdom? Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So Jesus is not saying, let's start with what he's not saying. He's not saying that he's somehow physically embodied in the poor and the broken and the prisoner of our society. That Jesus himself somehow comes and descends on these people and to walk by them is to walk by Jesus. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that the way that we treat the oppressed, the poor, the broken, the downtrodden, the discouraged, the lost in our society is reflective of our true heart that we have for him. This is one of those moments that can be very difficult for us. It's hard for us to know exactly what God is asking of us in this particular situation. God, what do you want? Am I, do, do I stop every single time that I see somebody on the side of the street that's asking for something? Do I, uh, do I constantly live in guilt that I'm not doing enough? Is the Schindler's List thing rising up like I could have done more, I could have done more, I could have done more? How do we handle this particular situation? call on our lives. What Jesus is looking for, what he's calling us to is this. I want you to know that the worship that you have for God, the affection, the love that you have for the king has to manifest itself in how you love the least of these. Does your heart posture open itself up to saying, God, who are you wanting me to minister to? What do you have for me to do on your behalf today? Because as you've done for the least of these, you've done for me, is Jesus saying, I want you to see that what you do for them, that is a part of your worship of me. Guys, this is, it's a challenge. It's a hard place to wrestle with. It's a hard thing to fully understand. And we'll go into this in much, much more detail as we go through the book of Matthew. But I wanted to bring this to your attention because I want you to see Jesus is calling on us to change our heart attitude. Again, we regard people not as according to the flesh, even though we once did that. Now we're starting to see them. Jesus, how do you see these people? And what can I do to represent you to the broken, to the needy, to the lost, to the oppressed? One of the ways that we see this played out is in a a, a passage in the book of Acts that's not about what I'm about to tell you about at all, all right? It's about something entirely different. In fact, if you read the whole thing, uh, the big climactic moment is that this gal is raised from the dead by Peter, but we're not even gonna get to that because that's not even what we're looking at it for. So go to Acts chapter nine, starting in verse 36. This is 
uh, a picture of somebody living out what Jesus just called us into in Matthew chapter 25. All right, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. And this is the, this is the part we're going to focus on. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. I love this passage. Again, Peter comes and raises her from the dead, and everybody's happy, and it's beautiful, but that's not what we're talking about. Tabitha, Dorcas, she gave her life to Jesus. Most likely, she was a second-generation Christian, meaning she was not in Jerusalem at Pentecost, but from there, people went out and started preaching the gospel, and she gave her life to Jesus, and as a part of her discipleship, she was taught about doing good, serving the widows and the orphans, loving people with the heart and compassion of God. So this woman who, again, most people that study this believe that she was wealthy, that she was known in the community. She gave her life to Jesus and her response to giving her life to Jesus was to say, Lord, how can I best represent you? How can I serve you in this community? So she started taking care of the widows. Now, the widows in the first century, essentially you had gals that would lose their husband and for whatever reason were not able to, uh, to remarry, and so they would fall into this category of widows. We see in Acts chapter 6, there were widows in the early church that needed to be taken care of. They were being neglected, and the apostles respond by bringing the first deacons in, saying, take care of the widows. This was a, a huge category of people that needed love, compassion, generosity, service, and oftentimes they went without any of those things. And so Tabitha takes it on herself. She comes to faith in Jesus and she says, what am I going to do with that? I'm going to love and I'm going to serve those that are forgotten in our society. And so she starts taking care of widows. She starts making them garments, clothes. So much so that when she dies and her body is laid in the upper room and Peter finally gets up there, you have this entire community of widows that is weeping over this dead woman and showing the garments that she made. This is one of those moments, you guys, that is not... It's not feeding the 5,000. It's not Peter standing up at Pentecost and preaching uh, the gospel and 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus. This is simple, faithful, loving generosity. What does it look like in your community to now see differently? I came to faith in Jesus. Who needs help? Who needs to be encouraged? Who needs to be loved? Who needs to experience the presence of God in their life? And Tabitha gives us a picture of what that journey looks like. And she started to love these women and take care of them and show generosity to them. And she changed an entire community. I love that story. I don't know if you guys love that story. I love that story. I think it's incredible. Now let's get back to talking about the learned skill of margin. Titus 3.14 is the last passage we're going to look at. Uh, Paul is writing to his young apostolic apprentice, a, a guy named Titus. Titus was going and putting elders into place in a lot of churches uh, around Crete and other communities. And Paul's teaching Titus how to make disciples. And he writes to Titus, and this is one of those verses, again, that we might breeze right over, but this is one of the instructions that he gives to Titus. He says this, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help in cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. So Paul, whose task of making disciples and planting churches translates to raising up Titus, whose task is making disciples and raising up churches, and he's teaching him how to do that. And he says, I want you to go into these communities and make sure that every disciple knows to devote themselves to good works and to prepare themselves to help in times of urgent need. Now here's one of the challenges with our, with our current culture. We live life to the absolute fullest like the absolute max. 
If you were to go back over the last 30 years, like that's actually been the message of the commercials, right? That's been what the world is trying to sell us, that you're supposed to live life to the fullest, to squeeze every drop out of life, everything that you could possibly get, every dollar that you could possibly spend, live it to the absolute fullest. And most of us have bought into that fully and completely. Our pace of life, our budgets have very little in the way of margin. We struggle to have anything left over at the end. We move so quickly through life that we oftentimes are not able to to help in cases of urgent need. And so one of the things that Paul is teaching Titus to teach disciples, I love that, that whole process, is to say, I want you to teach them to live differently than the world around us. To have our disciples choose to live on less, to to take the field of their lives and to not harvest all the way to the edges, but to dial back from that so that there is room to help in cases of urgent need. Choose to live differently. I recognize that a lot of us are, uh, I mean, we, we live in Southern California, right? We live in a place that is very expensive, full of very expensive activities, hobbies, responsibilities, whatever you want to call them. Every dollar has already been identified for something else. Some of you guys are in Dave Ramsey. Some of you are in Crown. Some of you are trying to double up and do both of them just to see if you can really get this thing nailed down. Money is one of the hardest places for us to find margin. But that's not the only call. That's not the only invitation of God to find space in our our budget for this. I think that's absolutely one of them, and all of us should be working on that all the time to live on less so that we can be ready to help in cases of urgent need. But there are other other spaces where this is really important. A few weeks ago, uh, we were talking about idols from the book of Matthew, and I asked... Uh, just if, if anybody had a prophetic word for the church. If we don't do that every week, it just it was something that we felt like maybe the Lord was, was doing in that moment. And uh, we had a guy share one thing, and we were you know, kind of talking about that afterwards, just kind of like, all right, was that, was that it? Was that what God wanted us to hear? And, and we didn't necessarily know if that was the word that God had, but right afterwards, uh, Barbara Richard came up to me, and she said, all right, while you were preaching... Uh, well, the entire time I was feeling this, and I, I didn't say something when you asked. I'm sorry. That's what she said to me. I'm sorry. And, uh, and I said, it's okay, but I'd love to hear it. And she said, I feel like for our church, the, the idol uh, that, we, that we worship is our time, maybe more than anything else. That, that being able to control our time, our calendar, is the most important thing to us. She said, I know it is for me, and that God is, is actively working on ripping this out, this, this grip that that my time has and control of my time has on my life. Well, a week later, uh, Matt Lawahi came up to me and he said, hey, I know you asked us to share this last week. I didn't, but I want to share it with you now. Uh, I really feel like God's putting it on our our church to uh, to submit our time uh, to him. You know, you, you start to pick up on themes after a little while that when you ask for God to speak and he does, you want to listen to that. Guys, this is where I'm supremely guilty. I do not live my life with a lot of margin in my days. It's not just that every dollar has has, has already been spoken for. Sometimes it feels like every minute of the day has already been spoken for. Somebody asked me for coffee the other day, and I told them that I could in three and a half weeks. And I just, like I want to say, I didn't know what to do with it. I I don't want that life. Now, granted, if everybody asks me for coffee every day, then it's going you know, to go long, and I get that. But just the, the here's trying to apply this to real life. When we think of our lives and we look at the, the way that we live, are we choosing? Are we choosing intentionally to live differently so that if God needs to have us do something, we are ready to say Yes. One of my uh, least favorite stats that I've ever heard in the history of ever, uh, this came out yesterday, or not yesterday, last year, sorry, uh, is that the average American spends 30 hours a year searching Netflix. Not watching Netflix, (laughs) searching Netflix, trying to find something to watch. 30 hours a year, just throwing that out there, 30 hours a year. 
Not blaming anybody, and not putting that out there. I just, just want you to hear that and let that roll around in your head while we talk about choosing to live differently. We may feel like there's no margin in our life, like there's no room. Every minute is spoken for, but I think if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, that's not entirely true. If we're submitting our lives to our king and saying, I want you to have space. I want you to have room to intervene, to inject yourself to call on me, to meet with somebody, to pray with somebody, to minister to somebody, to love somebody, to speak prophetically into somebody's life. If God's putting a burden on your heart for somebody in a coffee shop and you just, you know, you don't, you don't need to run out to the next appointment, but you can, you can move over to them and just say, God, God's telling me to say this to you or I want to encourage you. I feel, like, I feel like I have something to encourage you with or can I pray for you? The reality is there's room we just, have to, we just have to discipline ourselves to find it. We have to devote ourselves to good works so as to help in cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Does any of you aspire to be unfruitful in your life of faith? I don't, I don't know. Most of us don't. Most of us don't choose to follow Jesus and then say, I want to live the rest of my life totally unfruitful. It's typically the opposite. Lord, use me. Here I am. Send me. How do you want to put me to work? Where can I go? Who can I speak to? And then we structure our lives in a way that none of those things are actually possible. So with our money, with our time, with our energy, with our skills and abilities, maybe your dollars are maxed, but you have some specialty that you can contribute. You can do legal work for child hope services. You can, you can drive out and help clear the brush at Zoe. You can do things with your, with your physical skills, just like Tabitha did, to, to make garments for these lovely women that needed to be encouraged. Maybe there's more that you can do in that space. I'm gonna close with this. So Erica, if you guys wanna come up and, and kind of get ready for this. Our tendency is to, uh, to hear a message like this and to start to feel the weight of guilt. I am not doing enough. Here's what I want to challenge you with. Uh, there is a slight difference that has massive implications, but there's a slight difference between conviction and condemnation. Okay, condemnation is the enemy saying, yeah, you're no good at this. You're never going to succeed at having margin in your life. There's no way. There's no how. This isn't going to happen. The enemy speaks condemnation into our lives to make us feel guilty, to make us feel shameful for the choices that we've made or the way that we've lived. That is the enemy at work. The Spirit of God brings conviction. Conviction is different. Conviction leads us to repentance. It leads us to hope. It leads us to a future. It leads us to walking with Jesus in those spaces. Conviction can feel very similar to condemnation in the moment, but has a completely different outcome. It draws us out of that place where we have been neglecting or sinful or choosing other things, and it draws us into a place of saying, Lord, I want what you have. Show me your way. Guys, our hope is that conviction is the outcome of a day like today. And it's not mine to convict. That's the spirit of God to convict, to draw you into this life. I'll say this last thing, and then I'll hand it over completely. Uh, we were praying this morning. Uh, Heather Wallach was praying at 8 o'clock. We gather in the, in the cry room. We pray together. Uh, Heather was praying, and she prayed, uh, Lord, thank you that you give us grace for the journey. And that just the implications of that, that we are broken people trying to sort through all that God has for us, and there's a destination that he wants us to arrive at, but God's not angry at us that we're not there right away. There's grace for us to grow. And my hope is that you would walk away saying, Lord, what do you want to chisel? What do you want to shape? What do you want to mold? What do you want to do in me? How do you want to keep sharpening my vision for this life? to be more engaged in your work, more engaged in your way of life. So even as we sing, as we, as we pray together, our prayer team's gonna be up here as you're taking communion or giving offering, just be asking that question. As you go into your community groups this week, just be asking that question, Lord, what do you wanna shape in me? What is a different way that you wanna shape in me right now than the way that I have been living? 
Let me pray for us. Lord, would you give us wisdom and insight into that? And would you show us grace and mercy as we, as we listen to you and grow? Lord, we need more of you. We need more of your way. And I just pray that you would show us how we can walk in your way. Uh, we love you, Jesus. We praise you as we worship you, Lord. Would our worship of you and the lives that we live outside of this room, would they be consistent? Uh, that the way that we view the least of these, Lord, that is a, a demonstration of our affection for you, our love for you, Lord. Would our, our hearts for the broken and the needy in our society and in this church, would they reflect our love for you, Jesus? We love you. We praise you. We lift up your name this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.